Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and in this video we're breaking down Star Wars A New Hope. Taking us to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, this film revolutionised the movie industry, and it still stands as one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. This was a film that I fell in love with as a kid, and I can't even count how many times I've watched it. Must have burned through those golden special edition VHSs so many times, and yeah, I'm so happy to talk about it again. Throughout this video, yeah, we're going to be going back through all that, breaking it all down, and talking about it scene by scene to go over all the details in it. You're all clear, kid, now let's blow this thing and go home! Now, according to the legends, George Lucas came up with the idea after he made his first full-length feature film titled THX 1138. Lucas had been a big fan of the Flash Gordon serials, and he'd actually been planning to adapt them in some form or another. Apparently at the 1971 Cannes Film Festival, when he was showing THX, he started putting feelers out to see if he could buy the rights for Flash. However, they were owned by Dino De Laurentiis, and thus Lucas decided to do his own space opera. Returning home from the festival, Francis Ford Coppola recalled him being very depressed he couldn't get the rights, so in the end he said, Well, I'll just invent my own. Great impression there, and pouring through John Carter of Mars, Gulliver on Mars in June, the ideas started to form in his head that would lead to what we got. Spending 8 hours a day, 5 days a week, he steamrolled through the ideas and found that the world building wasn't just something you could dive right into. Lucas said he made little notes, came up with names, and compiled a two-page synopsis titled The Journal of the Wills. The Wills themselves were thought of as being spiritual and religious beings who recorded ancient tales and told them in the form of stories. This is why we started with A Long Time Ago in a Galaxy Far, Far Away, because it was meant to evoke the idea this is an ancient story being told to us. The Guardians of the Wills, of course, appeared in Rogue One, and they've become something that's connected to the greater legends. Telling the tale of an apprentice known as C.J. Thorpe, this Jedi Bendu and his space commander Mace Windy would be who the story centred around. Now, you probably sort of recognise that last name there, and though a lot of the names Lucas came up with didn't make it to the first script, he did end up including them in the later movies. The Jedi name itself came from the Samurai Jedi Geki, and these knights would follow an honor system like the Jedi. Now, realizing that this original Will story was too difficult to follow, he then started again from the ground up with the Star Wars. Sharing elements of Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, George put together a 13 page outline and then shopped it around. The Hidden Fortress actually gets a little nod in the film, with us getting this line from General Motti. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. C-3PO and R2-D2 are also based off the bickering peasants, with the Imperial and Rebel logos also resembling Japanese crests. Now, originally, R2 could actually speak English, with him constantly cursing, and according to IMDb trivia, though his speech was removed, they kept C-3PO's reactions to him. I've just about had enough of you. Now, Lucas unfortunately faced another knockback when United Artists declined the treatment. They said the budget was too big, and this was something the other studios shared as well. Lucas shopped the script to Paramount and Universal, with both thinking that it was way too ambitious. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Disney turned it down too, which cost them a couple billion decades later, but in the end, 20th Century Fox picked up the project. Lucas was given $150,000 to write and direct, which, looking back, is absolutely crazy. No one had faith in it, but this actually proved to be good for him, because it allowed him to negotiate lots of things surrounding it. He secured the rights to the sequels, got most of the merchandising money, and also became best mates with everyone that hit the thumbs up button. Now by 1974, he'd done four different rewrites, swapping out characters and plot lines in search of a story. In these, he'd created the Sith and Death Star, along with a general named Anakin Starkiller. Starkiller was then changed to a teen, and he became a side character to a family of dwarves. Yup. Not joking, and Lucas did eventually use Dwarves and Willow, which isn't the only idea that he saved for later. Han Solo was made, but he was a green-skinned alien with his homie Chewbacca who was based on his dog. This just so happened to be called Indiana, which yeah, no prizes for guessing what he later used that on. Now George said he used to ride with his dog in the passenger seat next to him, and he'd often remark as him being like a co-pilot. Anakin was changed to Luke, with him then becoming his father, who was a former Jedi Knight that had died during the war. Luke and his brothers all lived on a farm, and it then evolved into a fairy tale fetch quest that took place across the galaxy. 
The Force was created and this draft ended with a text crawl that talked about what was going to happen in the next movie. Again, you can kind of see where they shifted across, but one big text changed George's mind. That is, Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is something that he's said to have been inspired by. And this is something we've brought up in a lot of breakdowns before, and it's a journey that Luke follows almost beat for beat. They all ended up taking elements of the legends of King Arthur, with Obi-Wan becoming a wizard echoing Merlin. C-3PO calls Luke Sir Luke. I see Sir Luke. And Jedi Knight are of course based on knights. No prizes if you got that one. Now by the third draft, things really started coming together, and at this point Lucas ended up pulling in Ralph Macquarie. He started creating concept art, which you can find online, and a lot of this has been repurposed for different projects. For example, stuff like the Stormtrooper designs have been brought up as Easter eggs in other properties, and you can catch this as a bridge between the clones and the Stormtroopers in the Bad Batch. Now they're of course inspired by the Nazis, with a lot of the Imperial garb echoing their uniforms from World War II. Everything about them is rules and bureaucracy, which is why all the characters appear in black, white and grey. It's all very formal, whereas the rebel characters that aren't connect to it have more of these sort of natural colours to them. Now in this draft, Darth Vader is pretty close to what we got, and we can also catch the evolution of Chewbacca. If you're a fan of rebels, then you're going to instantly recognise the original design, and this is the same species that Zeb is in that show. C-3PO's design was inspired by Maria from Metropolis, an R2-D2's R2 name was brought up on American Graffiti. The crew asked for reel number 2 of the second dialogue track, which ended up being R2-D2. All in all though, it's Han Solo who underwent the most changes, as the guy's got a lightsaber, big beard, cape and a headpiece, and to be honest, I actually quite like this a lot. Now Macquarie created lots of the ships in the sets, and he pretty much set the look for the entire saga. This third draft was also where Luke's father died, and Luke has brought in Ben Kenobi to play as the character's mentor. Titled Star Wars The Adventures of Luke Starkiller, he worked with Gloria Katz and Willard Huck, and they finished that fourth draft in 1976. With help from Brian De Palma, Lucas cut down the text crawl, as originally they'd said it was long enough to cover an entire driveway. Lucas said he wanted it to come across almost like a poem, and that it had to convey a lot of information in as short a space as possible. Now this mimicked the Flash Gordon serials, which too opened up with one, and it even contained things like chapter titles and capitalised words, which Lucas would end up later bringing across to the series. Now the limited budget also helped Lucas with the look he was trying to attain, and rather than just going with new and shiny stuff, they gave the universe an almost battered lived in look. This most notably carried across to the Millennium Falcon, with them using elements of scrap metal planes to build out the entire ship. What a piece of junk! In total, they built 30 sets over 9 sound stages at Elstree Studios, with this being one of the most expansive films of all time. The Rebel Hangar was placed at Shepparton Studios in Europe, and finally after the film was cast, everything was ready to go. Now that takes us into the movie itself, with us getting that infamous title and text crawl to kickstart it off. Originally the movie was just titled Star Wars, but in later re-releases they added the episode count and the New Hope titling. We of course also hear John Williams' score blasting away, and like a lot of elements in this movie, it too was inspired by other works. Back when Philip Molina was at New Rockstars, he did lots of Star Wars breakdowns and pointed out that parts of the score riffed on the one from King's Row. Now from here we cut to space above the planet Tatooine and watch this attentive Ford desperately races across the galaxy. Looking minuscule and unimposing, it's completely dwarfed by the Star Destroyer which comes in and engulfs the entire top half of the screen. In just this moment alone, we instantly get the David and Goliath stakes here, with the tiny rebel ship appearing minuscule compared to what's chasing it. The attentive comes into the shot and disappears into the horizon in what I counted as roughly 2 seconds. Juxtaposing this, the Star Destroyer eats up the whole frame for a total of 11 seconds before we finally get to the point where we actually see its engines. That's an incredible time difference and it shows Lucas's ingenuity when it comes to framing the two sides. We're immediately aware of how expansive and far-reaching the Empire's grasp is, and its tooth-shaped ship feels almost like the mouth of a shark closing around its prey. In the end, we can't even see the Tantive because it completely covers it up and lets us know these guys stand no chance. Now from here, we get a front-facing view of it and watch as it gets battered. 
It tries to fire back, but this doesn't do any damage, whereas in the next shot we see as it's almost torn apart by one of the destroyer's blaster bolts. On the top we can see a rectangular satellite, and this design would later be brought across to the Millennium Falcon in the sequel trilogy. Both are Corellian craft, so that makes sense, especially with a Falcon containing lots of used parts. Also, I will reference some of this stuff in the later movies, just to show how later things were recycled, because I'll probably never cover those films in depth, if I'm being honest. I'm not a massive fan of them, but I think I'd be remiss to not point out where certain lines and elements reappeared. Now that's actually important to bear in mind as well, because C-3PO's first line in the saga also ended up being his last line in Rise of Skywalker. I'll not keep hopping on about those, but it is kind of interesting to see how retroactively things were changed. That scene in Vader himself, who originally was thought to have breathing apparatus as a way to travel through space. This was of course later changed to be due to injuries, with him becoming Luke's father. Originally Lucas actually wanted Orson Welles to provide Vader's voice, but he did feel like it might be too recognisable. Thus he settled with James Earl Jones, who was lesser known at the time, and David Prowse provided the physical performance and vocal work on set. Start tearing this ship apart piece by piece until you found those tapes. Find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive! You know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic... You mission. are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. Kind of funny looking back at this, and I, if, if this isn't what Vader sounds like in your head, mate, you're not a real fan. You're not a real fan. Now, unfortunately, as much as I love joking about this, Prowse got really fucked over. The bodybuilder learned every line only to be told that his voice had been edited out. He brought so much to the role and was promised to actually get to show his face at some point down the line. However, come the end of Return of the Jedi, even that was taken away from him. Replaced by Sebastian Shaw, Prowse never got to show his face and it is kind of a sore point for me when I look back at this role. I'm sure they did something recently where they, ch Channel 4 or something, they reshot the ending and had him in the costume for a sort of what if thing, but unfortunately I couldn't find it online. Still though, he was brilliant and I don't think Vader would have worked half as well without his physicality. A C-3PO was also supposed to sound different too, with him being more along the lines of a used car salesman. Daniels performing the lines on set though was what won Lucas around and his snooty British butler portrayals shaped the character going forward. Now in hindsight, we know from Rogue One how Princess Leia got the plans and they based this guy around the person Vader strangles here. They also brought over his red eyes for that movie and a little part of the costume that you might not have noticed before. Here we can see that he actually has a sash over his shoulder piece which too appears in that film. As for Carrie Fisher's costume, she wasn't allowed to wear underwear because you'd be able to see through her clothes and notice that she was wearing a bra and stuff. Carrie joked that she guessed there was no underwear in space, which Lucas then retorted by giving her a bikini in Return of the Jedi. Now you might also notice that C-3PO has a silver leg, and I did some research on exactly why this was. I discovered that when Anthony Daniels wore the costume for the first time that one of the leg pieces shattered and the plastic actually stabbed him in the foot. I don't think this is a replacement though, as the, the rumours say that was a left leg piece, and it might have just been a design choice, but yeah, if you know, yeah, let me know. Later on in the canon, they'd state a bomb was placed into it, but the leg wasn't dipped in gold paint, but yeah. You know what, the comments section, it's perfect for stuff like this. Now C-3PO talks about the spice mines of Kessel. What are we going to do? We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel, smashed into who knows what. And as mentioned earlier, Lucas took elements of Dune, including spice, which is a hypnotic drug mined from Arrakis. Tatooine is based on that planet, and the voice was brought over to the Force, where Obi-Wan can Jedi mind trick stormtroopers, just like how Paul can convince people to do stuff. Moisture farming is of course a big part of Dune as well, and that's of course what Luke and his family do on their farm. Now the spice mines appeared in Solo, a Star Wars story, and it's here that we saw more of the Wookiee slaves. Later on, when Luke tries to put the handcuffs on Chewbacca, he seems genuinely angry, even though he isn't on the plan. Now we know about them being enslaved, and people have theorised that's why he was angry, but yeah, whether that's the case or not is completely up to you. Interestingly, we were originally going to cut to Tatooine during this and get introduced to Luke watching the battle overhead. This scene introduced Biggs, who would later appear on Yavin, and he also inceptioned Luke with his plans of joining the Rebellion. Now this took place at Toshi Station, which later appeared in the book of Boba Fett. During episode 2, we saw the couple Kami and Laser, who were brought across from this deleted scene. 
And the Tatooine scenes were also shot in Tunisia, with Tatooine being a real place that inspired the planet's name. Anyway, Leia gives over the plans, and she's eventually stunned and taken in. Watching her peer around the corner, blaster raised high, is such an iconic shot, and it instantly lets you know everything you need to know about the character. I also love how Lucas had the foresight to change what the blaster bolts for this look like, and it's really clever how the stun blast spreads out almost like a net, or like there's some bowlers. These are of course used to capture things, and again, it shows how much the imagery Lucas presents does a lot of the heavy lifting. Now 3PO and R2 manage to escape, which is when they crash land right below on the planet. After the pair split up, we can catch the skeleton of a crate dragon, which has of course appeared in lots of the expanded lore. Obi-Wan ends up mimicking the roar of one later on, and this has actually been changed and updated a lot of different times. Now apparently they didn't actually clean up the bones, and you can go and see them out in the desert. Kinda hoping in 1000 years when people have forgotten about this film that humans can come across it and just make up some shit about how there actually used to be crate dragons. Now this was actually the repurposed skeleton of a Diplodocus, which was a carryover from Disney's One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing. The pair splitting up leads to a cool moment with R2, and they actually reuse the sound of the Jawas here for the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi. Now the Sandcrawler appears like a hulking giant structure, but this was actually a miniature that was about two foot tall. With some creative camera work though, they managed to make it an imposing behemoth, and inside we see several Star Wars droids. This includes an RA-7 protocol droid, which was nicknamed an insect droid or a Death Star droid depending on what you read. Later on, when they're waiting at the lift to go to the prison block, we can catch the same model walking along, showing how this costume was actually repurposed. There's also a periscope droid, and you can catch a gunk as well. These are basically walking batteries, and they've appeared in a number of films and spin-off projects, including The Bad Batch. Now in the desert, we see stormtroopers riding on dewbacks, with this scene being reshot with added CGI for the 97 special editions. Originally, they didn't have the budget to have them moving about, and lots of the dewbacks in the film were replaced with digital ones, so they had more animation to them. <laughs> Now eventually the droids arrive at the farm, and Luke's Uncle Owen purchases C-3PO. What I really need is a droid who understands the binary language of moisture evaporators. Evaporators? Sir, my first job was programming binary load lifters, very similar to your evaporators in most respects. In hindsight, we know that C-3PO was built by Anakin, and him having this functionality makes sense due to where Anakin lived. We also get this line. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Which Hamill has said people constantly make fun of him about. Owen also tries to buy the droid R5, and lots of things have come from this moment, with there even being a non-canon comic about it that said the droid was actually force sensitive. Titled Skippy the Jedi Droid, this, this said R5 purposely self-sabotaged because it sensed that R2 had to meet with Luke. It's really funny, but R5 has of course been brought across to the Mandalorian, where it still carries its bust up motivator. We watch C-3PO taking an oil bath and see Luke playing with a T-16 Skyhopper, which we can actually see the real life version of to the right just behind him. In the expanded lore, Luke piloted this a lot, and it's something that he used to fly through Beggar's Canyon. This model actually appeared later in the saga, or, or, or earlier, because Obi-Wan gave it to Luke at the end of his solo series. At this point in the hero's journey, we're hit with a call to action, which comes in the form of Leia's message. Luke clearly wants to go on adventures, but his uncle just wants him to work around the farm and drink blue milk. We'll not, <laughs> we'll not go into what happened with blue milk later down the line, but Mark Hamill actually said that the original blue milk in the film was what they call long life milk, and it was based on what you'd find in camping stores where you don't have to refrigerate it. Blue milk is actually taken from Banthers, which we later meet along with the Tusken Raiders. Now their masks were based around World War II gas masks, namely the ones that British kids used to wear. Owen mentions Anchorhead, and this has been brought up in the expanded lore along with the Book of Boba Fett. It's a small town on Tatooine that offers some connection to other towns, namely Mos Eisley and Mos Esper. I also love how Lucas puts in the little line about his father that actually gets better after you watch the sequels. Luke's just not a farmer, Owen. He has too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. 
As we mentioned, Lucas didn't originally have Vader as his dad, and this was just supposed to reference Anakin being a Jedi. However, in hindsight, it adds so much more to us, giving us the feeling that there's a worry he could go bad. Luke then looks out over the binary sunset, which instantly hits every Star Wars fan right in the fields. This idea of looking over the horizon and longing for a life of excitement is something I think everyone can relate to. We're also hit with the two alien suns, giving us the feeling that something's magical about this world. On top of that, the score does a lot of the heavy lifting, and it just makes this scene one of the best in the entire saga. It's no wonder every trilogy in the series has mimicked this scene, and both the prequel and sequels end with a moment like this. Turn it off mate, I'm get, gonna, gonna cry. Anyway, Luke goes back to C-3PO and he finds him standing in the dark next to a V-35 landspeeder. This is what we later see upon entering Mos Eisley with the prop being used to build out the world. We discover R2 has escaped and Luke ends up going out looking for him in his landspeeder which is an X-34. Back in the day they of course couldn't CGI out the wheels so they used a mirror and then rub Vaseline onto the lens to hide it. Eventually, they reached some banthers, and these were actually elephants dressed in banther guard with fake fur and horns. They obviously weren't used to the heat, and apparently on set they kept pulling this off. They're then ambushed by Tusken Raiders, with Lucas having to play a shot and then reverse it, so the Raiders seemed like they were on screen for longer. R2 ends up hiding away at this point, and this is something they've updated for the re-releases. Originally, he wasn't hiding behind that many rocks, but they added more ones in digitally. But there is just one problem, mate. H how did he get in there? Anyway, Obi-Wan then saves them and says, Hello there. This is something the characters repeated throughout the saga, with it sort of becoming like the character's catchphrase. Hello there. Hello there. Now Obi-Wan then takes Luke to his home and tells him about his father. He shows him his lightsaber, which he pulls from a wooden chest. Now this was actually later used in 1978 Superman, with it being the box that the kryptonite was stored in. At this point the Clone Wars are mentioned as well, and we also get a bit of backstory on the Jedi. For over a thousand generations the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic. Before the Dark Times. Before the Empire. Also we can see there's a little mark on Obi-Wan's shoulder. Retroactively it's been said that this happened during the battle with Anakin, and he took this wound to the shoulder which has then remained on his robes. Now from here we cut to the Death Star, which again symbolic of the Empire's dominance in the galaxy. Resembling a mechanical moon, this shows how they've stripped out all life and replaced it with unfeeling machinery. That's very much the case with Darth Vader too, with him no longer being a man and he's more like a machine. Now, bit of behind the scenes trivia that strips away how threatening this all is. Tarkin's boots didn't actually fit, so a lot of these scenes with him were shot from the waist up, with him then wearing slippers. Now it's kind of wild looking back to Vader knowing what we know now and they full on just disrespected the man and called his religion stupid. You forget how much of a lackey Vader was in this movie but eventually he'd be shifted to become the most important character in the franchise. Dressed in white we can also see Wolfie Laren who's a big character in the expanded lore. Now Leslie Schofield is also there as well who was an actor that appeared in a lot of British stuff and we also have Cassio Taj who's cameoed in a lot of the expanded stories. Anyway, back to the sand crawler, Obi-Wan talks about how precise the blaster bolts are, which means it's Imperial, but um, I mean, I don't know mate, them stormtroopers, they don't, they don't seem like they could hit the subscribe button on a brilliant breakdown, eh? Now Luke finds out his uncle and auntie have been roasted, like Mark Hamill's performance of But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. And from here, we then cut to Leia. A torture droid is brought in, and this has become a mainstay in Imperial interrogations. As we later learn, Her resistance to the mind probe is considerable. It will be some time before we can extract any information from her. Which in hindsight we could attribute to her being force sensitive. Back with Luke and Ben, we see Ben's gutted, gutted that Luke's family's been killed, and it now means that he's gotta follow him on this adventure. What do you mean he also tried to kill his dad? Anyway, they head out to Mouse Eisley, and Lucas of course vastly changed this with the release of the special editions. As they go in we see Womp Rats before cutting to the main city which has a rebel ship behind it. We can also catch the Dowager Queen which according to the legends crash landed on the planet. As they drive in we can also see Dash Render's ship the Outrider leaving Mos Eisley. Star of the N64 game Shadows of the Empire, Render's gained a cult following and this is such a cool little addition. There's also a swoop bike from that game which passes by Oronto and this scares it into dropping its chowers. 
Honestly, I feel like they just kind of went a bit mental with the CGI on this in later years, and every frame just has stuff flying around non-stop getting in the way. They started asking whether they could and didn't think about whether they should, which leaves a kind of feeling just a bit of a mess to me. Anyway, they head to the Mouse Eyes the Cantina, which is meant to resemble an old-timely western one. C-3PO is ordered out of it, and retroactively this was said to be because of tensions with droids raised during the Clone Wars. Why? It's said in the book from a certain point of view that the bartender's family were actually killed by battle droids. Also, I'm sure you know, but just in case you don't, the canteens on the bar were later repurposed to be used as the head of IG-88. The cantina really brings the universe to life, I feel, and there's a ton of different aliens here that help flesh out the world. So many creatures, and of course the cantina band, which just helps to add character to the universe. Now, amongst the aliens, we get Ponda Baba and Dr. Cornelius Everson, who ended up cameoing in Rogue One. Obi-Wan shows how deadly that a lightsaber can be, and I love how it immediately kills the mood in the bar before people just return back to their drinks. This reminds me a lot of a western cantina shootout where there'd be a quick draw and then everyone would just put their heads down and avoid making trouble. At this point, we meet Han Solo and Chewbacca. Lucas brought over Harrison Ford from American Graffiti, but originally he wasn't supposed to star in the film. In auditions, Lucas used Ford as someone who would read lines with the other actors, but he quickly realised he was the best person for the job. He's sort of the quote-unquote Han Solo of the Star Wars saga, and yeah, what a bloody geezer. Now he talks about how the Millennium Falcon did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, which caused a number of people to be like, What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? This is because parsecs are a measure of distance and not time, however in Solo they had him complete it by going through the mall which shortened the distance down. Now that's been done retroactively, but in the line I actually found a script showing that Ben reacted in disbelief at this clear misinformation. Luke doesn't because he hasn't been in space, so it was a nice little touch I realised upon reading the screenplay. Now from here Han runs into Greedo, which is something that Lucas has changed multiple times. Whether he shot first, Greedo shot first, I don't even know at this point, but he's added in things like digital dodging, misses, even though Greedo's that opposite. And yeah, what a mess. To me, I'll, I'll always see him as shooting first, and that's because he's a scoundrel that's always one step ahead. Lucas said he realised though that Han should be a more noble cowboy like John Wayne, but yeah, people, they can go on character ox, mate. I bet you have. My clunky. <laughs> Now the latest Disney updates added in the line McClunky, which was a McClunky thing to do, but it's becoming clear that this scene's constantly going to get updated. Now Greedo actually reappears in the scene with Jabba the Hutt later on, and this too has been updated at numerous times throughout the years. Originally, it wasn't part of the film's theatrical release, and that was purely down to the movie's budget. They actually filmed the scene with an actor and had the intention to put a stop motion creature over him, and originally was going to look like a humanoid, and then they'd figure out the design in post. However, again, due to those budget and time constraints, they had to scrap it, and thus Lucas ended up writing around this scene. Paul Blake, who played Greedo, said his scene was then written, and this was as a result of having to cut this moment. Now, he actually got a deleted scene in The Phantom Menace with a young Greedo, that yeah. And the Jabba scene also gained the addition of Boba Fett in the 97 release. They had Han step on his tail to solve him walking around the back of Jabba, and this is also something I think they're constantly going to update. You can catch a white droid to the right, and this was reused from the wreckage of the Sandcrawler. Now we can also catch the alien Garendon spying on them, and his voice was actually made up of processed recordings of John Wayne. This actually marks this as being the actor's last appearance in something, and he sadly passed away in 1979. Now later on, as Luke goes into the hangar, we can also see a 94 placed onto the wall. Arabish would become a language in Return of the Jedi, but in the original release they just used English. In the cockpit we can see Han's golden dice, which has become an iconic prop in the saga, and we watch as the stormtroopers close in. On the Death Star we see as Tarkin threatens to destroy Alderaan, and you could say the people here end up in Alderaan places. Maybe Leia should stop talking, like talking, like talking. Ooh, you suck! And the planet of course popped up in Obi-Wan, and Leia gives the name of the rebel space as being on Dantooine. This actually turned out to be true from a certain point of view, and Rogue One was going to show the rebels escaping the planet before moving to Yavin. Either way, Tarkin still decides to blow it up, and if you slow down the blast taking the planet, you can actually catch its atmosphere set on fire before the beam hits the body. Cut to Obi-Wan, and we immediately see him grabbing his chest as he senses all the deaths. 
As a kid, I never really drew the connections to nuclear weapons, but this is happening roughly 30 years after the first atom bomb was dropped. As an adult, I do wonder whether Lucas saw this as an eventual conclusion of warfare, and planetary destruction is the way we're destined to go. Now we also see Luke practicing with his lightsaber against a Marksman H flying remote. These would appear in the sequels and prequels, and they became a pretty standard way for Jedi's to train. You also see the hollow chest board, and originally they wanted two extra pieces on here. However, VFX artist Phil Tippett said it felt too cluttered, so these were removed. In Solo, we see Chewie breaking the table, and these two pieces fall off as a nod to this cut. The chessboard also gets shit off, and in The Force Awakens, they actually pick up from this movie and then finish out the animations. At this point, the ship's pulled into the Death Star, and they have to hide under the floor. Lucas, of course, had Han as a smuggler, so it makes sense these compartments would be part of his ship. Sneaking into the base disguised as stormtroopers, we also see on the back of the uniforms that they have tubes on them. In the original Ralph McQuarrie designs, the guards all had their own lightsabers, which this tube was originally meant to be. Luke later says, I can't see a thing of this helmet. Which was actually improvised by Mark Hamill. It said he couldn't see out the helmet, and in the end, they kept the line in. Obi-Wan eventually ends up leaving them, and we get this line. Well, you said it, Chewie. Where did you dig up that old fossil? In the script, we know this line is him actually saying, the old man's gone mad, and Chewbacca all sends up scaring off a mouse droid, which was apparently made up on set on the day. Going to the prison block, they then give the number, 1138, which is a call back to Lucas's THX 1138. They also say, 2187, which also ended up being Finn's number in The Force Awakens, aka FN2187. Nice little detail, if we go back to just before Han, Chewie and Luke left the droids, we can see THX 1138 on the screen on the monitor behind them. Now according to the rumours, Harrison Ford actually refused to learn his lines for this part, as he wanted the conversation to come off as being spontaneous. But uh, everything's perfectly alright now, we're fine, we're all fine here now, thank you. How are you? In the trash compactor, we see a Dianoga, which actually ended up becoming a big boss in Shadows of the Empire. The game also showed off the actual true size of it, with these tentacles being something that could have pulled Luke to his death. Filming wasn't too easy either, and Hamill actually burst a blood vessel from holding his breath for so long. Now the door here was actually the same one as the one on the Tantive 4, with it being painted white to be used on that set. The scenes on the ship were actually shot after this, and due to the budget, they had to reuse parts of the sets in order to film other parts of the movie. Now upon escaping, Hamill kept insisting that he should have his hair constantly matted down due to the water, and according to IMDb trivia, Harrison Ford, yeah, Harrison Ford said, Kid, it ain't that kind of movie. If they're looking at your hair, we're all in big trouble. Now alongside the trash compactor scene, we get a playful little gaff when the Stormtroopers finally get a 3PO and R2. I'm sure everyone knows about the Stormtrooper banging their head, but originally this wasn't noticed until after its release. In later editions, Lucas actually added a little sound effect on it. Take over. Take over. Take over. It just kills me a bit they added this in, and Lucas later had Django also bang his head when entering Slave 1 in Attack of the Clones. Now one thing you might notice is that they kept the Stormtrooper belts, and this allows Luke to repel with Leia across one of the chasms. Shooting a Stormtrooper, we also get what's the first Wilhelm scream in the saga. This has appeared in, I think, every Star Wars project, with it sort of becoming like a running gag. Also, this kind of set up the rule of door controls in Star Wars, being something you can shoot to lock a door, but if the door's locked and you, you need it to open, you can also shoot it, and, it, and just depending on whatever the writer needs at the time, it's going to work like that. Just shoot the panel. Now Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher actually performed this stunt for real with them getting the swing in one take without the need for stunt doubles. Such a cool scene, and it segues perfectly into Obi-Wan vs Vader. This of course carries a lot with it, and over the years it's become one of the most referenced duels in Star Wars. The original version, it was kind of all over the place with the sword shattering at several points during filming. Also, when they clashed, a weird green light would strike up the recording, and Obi-Wan's blade remained almost white due to the rotoscoping not really being there. Now, this is one thing they really cleaned up in the re-releases, with the colouring being added to the blades and the green glow being cut down. Now, originally, this was the only meeting between the pair since Obi-Wan beat and mutilated him. However, the Disney Plus series it completely retconned all that. 
Based on samurai fights, this was originally slow, methodical and deliberate with all the strikes intended to be killing blows. Now what I love about its ending is that the last thing Obi-Wan sees is Luke and Leia reunited. He glances over and sees them safe before sacrificing himself and letting Vader deal a killing blow so he can become one with the Force. I love how in hindsight Obi-Wan was there when they were born and he was instrumental in splitting them up to hide them from their father. In the end, he gets to see them back together and his final act is buying them time to get away from their dad. Again, it's sort of like poetry they rhyme and from here the group then make a break for it. Now all the battles in space were inspired by World War II cockpit footage to add this feeling of authenticity to the dogfights. Attacked by TIE Fighters, this stands for Twin Ion Engines which has retroactively been given to it because at the time Lucas called it that because it looked like a bow tie. Vader of course has his own one later on and this was done to help the audience distinguish which one he was in. From here they then reach Yavin 4 and the outside of this was filmed at the Mayan Temple Gardens in Guatemala. At this point we see the Death Star plans which were lost to time after the movie wrapped. Thus they never had this as an asset and had to rebuild them from the ground up to be used in Rogue One. That movie actually retroactively sets up some stuff in this scene with Red 5 being killed at the battle above Scarif. That film includes stock footage from this movie as well and it also finally gives us Blue Squadron. Now originally Red Squadron was going to be blue but with the blue screen backgrounds they ended up having to change it. Now the numbers were given because on the wings of the ship you'd have extra stripes denoting the numbers. Unfortunately when Lucas redid all these scenes digitally all the models were replaced with identical wings. Now they head out and Ben talking to Luke in the cockpit w would throw me off I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Man's voice just drops it out of nowhere as he's taking off and it's like Luke, the force will be with you. Like you could have legitimately crashed off that mate. And there's also Porkins who you might recognise from the movie Batman. Either way it leads to a big battle in the trench which is based off the film The Dam Busters. It's mistakenly thought that the trench is a line that runs right along the centre of it but if we look at the plans you can see that the trench is actually located at the north pole of the station. Darth Vader comes in and if you look at his helmet in some shots you can actually see David Prowse's eyes in there. Now we are of course also introduced to Wedge Antilles played by Dennis Lawson and he's actually the uncle of Ewan McGregor. Now the first shot the rebels takes misses and it means that Luke has to be the one to come in and save the day. A nice little detail is that later on when he shoots at the target you can actually see the mark of the miss in the top left of the screen. Vader closes in but he gets saved by Han and in the end uses the force instead of his target and computer. He hits the bullseye like it's the like button and we end with them blowing this thing and then going home. I know it's cliche for Han to come in last minute and say the day but something about this just hits so hard and it's one of my favourite moments in the entire saga. There's so many different elements going on here and it just makes the scene and the sense of alleviation so tense. You've got the Death Star getting in range to fire at the base R2 gets taken out, Luke turns off his targeting computer and Vader's on his ass like the neglectful father that he always was. He gets him in his sight and then Han comes in last minute and just wrecks shop. Have you not? Love the score here as well and it just drives home the triumph as we see the Death Star explode and talking along with it. Vader of course gets away after his tie spins out of there and Lucas had a real battle to keep this shot in the movie. People behind the scenes felt it set up a sequel which at the time were considered inferior cash-ins. As we know though it of course got kept leading us to be able to get the character back in Empire. Now Luke returns home to a hero's welcome and though R2 is busted up he's gonna be okay. I actually wonder if they messed him up because of the blue screen cause they had to darken his colours down for the space scenes again for that blue background. Messing him up just takes the focus off but yeah that might be wrong and just one big reach. Now they're all presented with medals and I'll always remember this ending getting carried over to Star Fox 64. Chewie doesn't get one which was a big sore point for the franchise but he does at least get the last line in the movie. Now Peter Mayhew who played him actually worked as an orderly at a hospital whilst filming the first three movies but he gained a ton of publicity off the back of this role. Eventually he realised he could just 
make a living off appearances, and he decided to go and do that full time. Now this was such a revolutionary film that changed how sci-fi was made from this point, and it's hard to deny how influential it was. I still think A New Hope is my second favourite film in the saga, with it only being topped by what comes next. It's an incredible start of the story, and it's got so many things in it that it's difficult not to marvel at how well it's made. This is a movie that was meant to be a nightmare in post-production, but it was famously saved in the edit. Lucas couldn't do reshoots because Mark Hamill suffered a car accident, and they ran into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. George Lucas, yeah, he was so sure this movie was going to bomb, he actually went on vacation in Hawaii instead of showing up at the premieres. Here with Steven Spielberg, they came up with the idea for Indiana Jones, which, to be fair, wasn't a wasted trip. As for this, it was the first movie to take 300 million at the box office, and in total it sold over 178 million tickets. This is across all of its various different runs, with it only being beaten by Gone with the Wind. The most that 20th Century Fox had made before this was 37 million in a year, but this movie saw their end profits being 79 million. The cast lucked out along with Lucas as well, and he gave Alec Guinness an extra 0.25% of the gross, which turned out to be an additional 2 million payday for him. In the end, I think it's impossible to deny how much this movie changed cinema, and yeah, I still love it as much now as I did all the way back when I was a kid. Just watching it takes me back to those days, you know, playing with Star Wars Micro Machines whilst I had the movie playing in the background. It's one of those films that shaped my entire life, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this breakdown as much as I have. We will of course be back with The Empire Strikes Back, and I'm also going to go into some of the classic sci-fi films like 2001 and Starship Troopers. So make sure you subscribe for that, and if you want to see those videos before anyone else, then please click the join button. We release our classic movie breakdown sometimes a week in advance for members, so definitely do it, and it costs you less than a price of a pound or a dollar a month. Now if you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Predator, which will be linked on screen right now. Hopefully I'll see you on the next one, and with that out of the way, thank you for clicking this. I've been Paul, and remember, the Force will be with you always. See you, chump.